Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am very, very excited to be hosting our guest today, who I will allow to introduce herself in a few. But um, if you're joining us, remember this is the My Science Journey bi-weekly webinar where we host scientists every two weeks to come on here and speak about their science journey, which we can learn from and also get inspiration from. And so today we are joined by a very exciting guest. She's currently in Tanzania with Real Sun. Exciting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I will now give her the chance to just introduce herself and take us through her science journey in her own words. And I'm so glad to see slides up with very exciting photos. Um, and I can't wait to hear all about it. So please, Marta, it's your time now. Hey. <clears throat> Apologies, I have a bit of a cold, so my voice is um, it's a bit tricky, but I'll try my best. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. First of all, really, I thank you, Anita, for inviting me. I, I love these type of initiatives. I'm very happy to share my science journey. Um, just to say that this will be quite a personal uh, presentation. I'm going to show you things about really about my life, not just about science and something that we probably don't do enough. And it's good to relate. Um, and yeah, uh, if feel free to to ask questions even in between. I, I think we could do this. I mean, you're the chair. I think a bit of an informal um, type of meeting. So I'm happy to. To, to stop whenever there's a question. So um, am I allowed to start, Anita? Yes, please, you can start. And um, if anyone has a question, feel free to raise your hand, write it in the chat, however feels comfortable for you. So uh, over to you, Marta, yeah. OK, thanks. So um, so yeah, my name is Marta Maya. I am a professor, an associate professor at the University of Oxford. I became a professor this year, actually. Um, so those who know me, they will know that that actually doesn't really mean much to me. It's it's a title, right? That doesn't really change anything in my life, doesn't change who I am. Um, but that just to say that, uh, yeah, I, I will use that title because you know, science and um, journey in science is kind of important to, for those who do think it's an important thing. But yeah, I did reach the professor level. So <clears throat> where am I from? I think that's probably where we're going to start. The slides are not moving. Oh, here we go. So I'm I'm Portuguese. Um, Portugal is a tiny little country next to Spain. Um, I didn't really grow up there. I grew up in lots of different places. Uh, I grew up in the United States and in Canada. And before that, I grew up in Venezuela. And then I did most of my high school and university in Portugal. Um, because I grew up in so many different places, I kind of gave me this, this urge to always move and to always find uh, new places and learn new cultures and learn new languages, which for those who personally know me, they they will relate that this, this is really something that I that I like. Um, and so I never imagined I would end up uh, working in global health or in Africa. And, um, and just like many of us, I was pretty lost in the first few years of my life. I didn't know what to do with my life. So I did something that, you know, the older generation would advocate for that, you know, you can give you money and it gives you a stable life. So I studied veterinary medicine. Um, so I went to university in Lisbon. Um, I studied veterinary medicine. I graduated in 2005. And again, at the end of my veterinary um, education, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I decided to specialize again in something that would give me, uh, well, would give me a good financial environment. So I specialized in animal surgery, in small animal surgery, particularly in cats. Um, and everything seemed to be going well. And uh, however, I there was a bit of a bump along the way. Uh, I was specializing in surgery and then I had a really terrible bicycle accident. <clears throat> and this is this is really how I got into science. Because of that bicycle accident, um, I had a um, period of my life where I had a, an arm that didn't really do whatever I wanted it to do. So I couldn't be a surgeon. Um, and <clears throat> so I, I got a little bit into science because it was something that I could do in front of a computer. Nowadays, my arm works perfectly fine, so don't don't pity me over that. So I'm, it's all recovered. Um, but basically, that's how I I got out of that um, out of that circle of surgery, and I went into science. And really, I thank that I thank for that uh, accident. Clearly, that was something that was not supposed to happen. It was something bad, but it put me on a different path. And although it was a wrong turn, it was the right direction. Um, so after that, I started to, to work on a, in a PhD in One Health Medical Entomology. 
Um, this came about because um, after I finished uh, working as a as a, as a as a surgeon, I was pretty good with you know working with uh, anat anatomy, and I was placed in a in a center that had a force with leishmaniasis lesions, and they wanted us to find out where did that leishmaniasis come from. And that introduced me a little bit into the vector world and into the vector control world. Um, but I didn't do a PhD in leishmaniasis. I had a colleagues from the University of Berlin who offered me the opportunity to do a PhD um, using a product that now is called ZeroFly from Western Catherine's. And, and ZeroFly, we used it in, in, in Ghana uh, to uh, fence uh, animal enclosures. And then we measured the amount of uh, defensive movements that these animals did against uh, flies and against mosquitoes and against uh, you know, blood sucking insects. And we correlated that with indexes of production. And that was, it was really important to see that uh, actually just simple nuisance insects are really, really detrimental to animal health um, and to production. But on the other hand, that net around animals also created a um, a way of diverting, of, um, so insects are, mosquitoes are attracted to cattle because they produce a lot of CO2 and they are very uh, attractive, but then they encounter that net. So it's a way of killing the mosquitoes that are um, moving towards the cattle. And that, in that aspect, it can be used as a malaria control intervention. I don't think this has ever been really implemented, but that was something that I researched during my PhD. Um, <laughs> Then after I did my PhD, I, I, I went back to Germany and I finished writing it up. And um, <clears throat> so again, something um, unexpected happened. I, I, I was pregnant and um, I had a baby. And then this all happened in the middle of a PhD. I don't know how many women here can relate to this. Uh, but so, yeah, I was a single mom. And so I did a lot of working and typing with babies on my lap. And that did um, mean that I probably graduated a year later, but really it was a wonderful time of my life. And I, I think that having a child at an early age, is, there are some benefits and some advantages to that as well. Um, because I was a single mom and I was in, in Europe, um, it was really hard for me to balance uh, and to have uh, a life with my child. Uh, with her and at the same time have full time job and of course I have to provide so um, having lived in Ghana I thought well why don't I just uh, do what I want to do which is go back to Africa and continue my journey in science and just try to figure it out with with my children with my daughter at that time so um, against against a lot of words of dissent particularly from my family and friends I I um, I took my baby and she was very small and I moved to Tanzania in fact, I moved to where I am now. Uh, it was 2009. The two of us just packed our stuff and we moved to a very rural area in southern Tanzania called Ifakar. Um, <clears throat> I was a postdoc and I lived there with her uh, at the Ifakar Health Institute um, from 2009 <clears throat> for to about 2011. And um, then after that, we moved to Bagamoyo in Tanzania, but it was a really good time of my life. And I think that in that decision, the decision to do what was good for me um, rather than just what, what was good for my daughter was the best and at the end of the day was the best for her as well. So in Tanzania, I looked at various uh, new methods or I tried to develop new methods to um, protect uh, people from um, malaria vectors and malaria vectors, they can, um, they have different behaviors according to their species. Um, they can bite you indoors. That's uh, um, in, um, endophagic, and they can rest indoors. It's endophilic, but they can also bite you outdoors, and they can also rest outdoors, and different combinations of that. So according to their behavior, you will have to develop different uh, control tools, and these control tools have to be catered to each location because each location will have, let's say, a different blend of mosquitoes. So. Um, the moment the most the most uh, common vector control intervention against mosquitoes are insecticide treated nets but insecticide treated nets only work uh to what number three and number four so endophagic and endo and endophilic endophagic exophilic all the other ones they don't really work for it so we try to find ways of covering these gaps in control which are up to today still an issue and uh, those outdoor biting mosquitoes and mosquitoes that um, bite you when you're not 
under your bed net. So in Inifakara, where I moved to, um, I started to work started to work on um, characterizing uh, repellents, both spatial and topical repellents. Um, so that we did some of the most robust characterizations of the mode of action of special repellents in Fakar. Um, these these are these are uh, papers and, and and that still stand and the endpoints that were de were um, determined at that stage how to actually evaluate whether a special repellent works or doesn't work. What are the best assays that you do? This is all um, research that um, I was part of during my years in Fakar, and we did. Um, we did work in the field uh, with, uh, of course, with uh, village in villages, but we also had a lot of work in experimental huts, which is what you see here on the left bottom corner. We had a lot of work in semi-field systems, which are basically ecosystems within um, a netted space. And we did the same also in tunnels. So this, this tunnel, for example, can actually help you measure distances, so both for repellent distances or attracting attractant distance, distances. You can measure distances of repellency. You can also measure distance of feeding inhibition. So how close do you have to be to a source of repellency for that mosquito not to want to feed anymore? ETC. Um, <clears throat> we did a lot of these experiments. Um, we also looked at, um, at DDT uh, because DDT was at some point uh, um, flagged as uh, potentially making a comeback. We looked at DDT and compared it to special repellents, and basically they had very similar mode of actions without the, the enormous uh, environmental impact that DDT may have. This is still debatable. Um, one of the things that I was personally very involved with in um, was in the uh, assessment of diversion of vectors from repellent users to non-users. So when you use a repellent, be it spatial or topical, um, that mosquito won't bite you, but that mosquito won't necessarily die. That mosquito will just go away. So where does it go and what happens after that? Um, so that's those are all some questions that are st still up for, for discussion. But, but the, one of the stu studies that we did, we took a village and we gave, um, we, we took several villages and we gave them different repellent coverage scenarios. We either gave people no repellent, other village we gave every, everybody in repellent. And then in, in one other village we gave um, only 80% of repellent. And, and this allowed us to measure uh, what happens to those people, those 20% that don't use repellent. So if there's an incomplete coverage, those who don't use repellent, are they gonna be more at risk or less at risk? And we did find out that the risk increases. So, and this makes sense because if you have um, the mosquito is repelled, it will go to the first available host that is not um, treated with that repellent. And this brings up a lot of ethical implications because in a in a trial setting, yes, you can endeavor to have a universal coverage of your repellent, but in a real life scenario, it's it'll be the more educated or the wealthier people who use repellent. So here you have like a little icon as a wealthy person, there's mosquitoes biting them, so they don't like that, they buy a repellent, or they have access to a repellent, or simply they know about repellents, and so they, they are more educated, they will use the repellent. Well, that mosquito will, of course, then go away because the person used the repellent, but won't die. It will simply go somewhere else, and it's most likely to go to someone who is less uh, privileged, who ha does not use uh, repellents either because they cannot afford them or because they are not um, educated enough to understand how to use them. Because even if you have access to the repellent, the adequate use of the repellent is really important. So um, regularly using it, a uh, number of hours that you are uh, protected and, um, and, and uh, applying it in enough amount and, and, and lots of other um, considerations that you have to have when you use repellents. So we did find that if you are surrounded in a village by people who do use and you don't use that, you're probably three times at risk. Um, so your incidence rate ratio of finding an arresting mosquito in your house increases by threefold. And this was quite big. Um, and we did have lots of uh, um, <clears throat> lots of meetings with uh, colleagues at WHO about having to have a better assessment of diversion. But up to today, a lot of this isn't really yet robustly analyzed. And I think a lot probably won't be because the trials that have been done on repellents have, have not shown uh, an adequate effect. So um, 
in 2013, uh, I was still in Fakara, still in, well, actually I was in Fakara Health Institute, I was based in Bakamoyo. Uh, I moved from the London School to the Cystic PH, and this was basically just a strategic move because if, for those who know Fakara, it's it's very much a Swiss TPH institute. So it's, it's, it's an independent institute in Tanzania, and the, old, the, the management is completely uh, independent in Tanzanian, but it has a very strong link to the Swiss TPH. So moving to the Swiss TPH was kind of important because of the grants and other, in other um, um, administrative re uh, reasons. So I continued the development and evaluation of novel vector control tools, but at this point I became independent. I was no longer a postdoc. I was a, a research, excuse me, a research collaborator. And I started to do research on um, plant-based interventions, be it um, attractants or repellents, and also attractive targeted sugar baits. And another thing that I started to do um, more was um, developing the development of systematic reviews. I became a member of the Cochrane Infectious Disease Group. And although they are incredibly tiresome, some people would argue they are boring, but they are very good. They are very good. It's a very good technique. Um, it's a very good thing to know how to, how to do a systematic review. It's pretty important, and realistically, this is these are the reviews that uh, inform guideline development. So you have, um, if you are, in, if you do Cochrane reviews, you are contributing contributing directly to guideline development. Um, after that, in Tanzania, I met my husband, and I think this has to be part of the story because that's why I moved from Tanzania. And at that point, I stopped being a single mom. Um, because he was Kenyan, um, uh, we moved to Kenya in, in, uh, in 2016, and uh, and we had two more children. And in 2016, I joined um, I joined the Camry Welcome Trust in Kivifi. Uh, it's a it's a wonderful place to work. Um, in addition to being a wonderful institution, it's also in a very paradise location. For those who know Kenya, this is uh, it's really a privilege to work there. And uh, in 2016, um, I moved there and I was uh, supported by a fellowship for, uh, given to me by the Swiss Foundation of Science, which was a fellowship uh, for women in science called the Marie, Marie Heim Vöcklin. Unfortunately, I don't think they continued this fellowship. I think it's been discontinued, but it was a really good fellowship because through this, it allowed me also to move. I, I spent some time in Glasgow where I did some um, experimental infections to develop uh, uh, surveillance tools. And they, they, you know, they catered for all sorts of, of um, child-friendly environments for me for the, um, a lot of me to cost in things like nannies in Glasgow, which I think is unthinkable and uh, inaccessible to most people. But, um, and it would have been to me had I not been um, funded by this fellowship. Um, so I got into surveillance, into the development of surveillance tools, and that was mainly through this this, this fellowship. Um, so surveillance tools um, are really important, and because well, you can't really control uh, malaria and malaria vectors if you don't understand what's going on with them. And mosquito uh, um, malaria vectors, they might bite you indoors, they might bite you outdoors, like I said. And nowadays, there's also urban vectors. And so it's really important to know which vector you're dealing with. And their behavior is somewhat conserved when it comes to species. But anybody who's, who works in the field or has done bionomics knows that after you do your field work, you actually have to take those to the lab and you have to do PCRs and genomics. And that costs a lot of money. So um, that's a big problem for those doing surveillance because um, the truth is we catch a lot of mosquitoes. And if you have to then pay for a PCR for each and every one of these mosquitoes, your budget will be uh, highly depleted. And for national malaria control programs, this is a bigger problem because they have to do this over and over again, over time and over space. So the development of, of new surveillance tools that allow for a cost-effective analysis is really important. And this is something that <clears throat> I started off by doing. Through this fellowship in Glasgow, I looked at near-infrared spectroscopy. Um, and it was indeed promising, but to my, in my view, it lacked a little bit of robustness. So the moment you move on to a different site, you would lose a little bit of robustness. You have to recreate the, the, the libraries. So um, then at some point, I started looking at Magic of MS, uh, opposed to near infrared. And that's something that till today I'm still working on at Camry Welcome. Um, and we have at the moment, I'm happy to say, uh, we created some libraries 
and these libraries are going to be made open access to anybody who has access to a model of MS, and this will be done with the support of, of Brooker, who are going to host a web-based application, and um, this will be um, hopefully once I have everything signed, uh, funded through the Build and Melinda Gates Foundation. So this is all very exciting because it provides um, a way of sharing the knowledge that we that we have developed in um, through our work in in Kenya on developing this tool for surveillance and cost effective surveillance. Um, so here you have spectra of different vectors, different vector species, but we know that actually this can be used for other parameters, not just vector species. It can be used also for um, for blood source analysis, so to know what what the vector feed on. Um, so I see it. Can we just see it for a second? Can you hear it, Anita? There's a blender. Can you hear it? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Mm -hmm. You can hear me. Okay, then let me just continue. Yes. Um, so then we used it also for blood node source analysis. And um, at the moment, we're also looking at it for a way to um, measure age, so the, how old the mosquito is, and also um, infections, or whether it's infected with parasites or not. So this is a bit work in progress, and I, I'm not going to show very much practice. Um, so in 2018, uh, I moved to the University of Oxford, and this was basically due to my move to Kenya. So after I moved to Kenya, I was still Swiss CPH because of the Swiss National Foundation of Science required me to maintain my affiliation to Swiss CPH. But Swiss CPH wasn't very keen on having people spread across Africa. They wanted me to stay in Tanzania, and I didn't want to. So I moved to, I was in Kenya, I moved then from Swiss CPH to Oxford, and I got a grant from Limited. Um, to evaluate a new intervention um, based on indectocytes. Um, so basically, this is this project called Bohemia, Broad One Health Indectocyte-Based Malaria Intervention in Africa. I had two sites, one in Kenya and one in Mozambique. And it evaluated um, the master of administration of ivermectin for malaria vector control. Um, so ivermectin is, a, is an antiparasitic drug. It's been used for, um, for decades to control parasites, but we also know that if you take that drug and the vector, a mosquito bites you, <clears throat> that they die, or that they just don't live long enough to, um, to transmit malaria. Um, so we hypothesize that if you treat everybody in a certain area, certain village or a cluster, uh, if you treat everybody at the same time, that this will have uh, an impact on the population of vectors and that will reduce um, transmission and therefore malaria incidents. And indeed, uh, we set off to do this. Uh, we did it in Kenya. This is in some of our team members here on the bottom. Uh, the team was much, much larger than that. Um, it's a very difficult uh, study to do. We did three rounds of MTA. We treated about 20,000 people, either with ivermectin or with albendazole, which is our control. We picked albendazole because albendazole is also a dewormer, but it doesn't kill mosquitoes, so it's a perfect control. Um, so we treated everybody in this cluster randomized. We treated everybody in each cluster with either one or the other. And um, we then measured malaria infection incidence over six months. And um, you can see in the graph, we have a reduction, of course, in malaria in both arms because we are treating everybody that we find infected. So there's that mass, mass, mass uh, screen and treat effect. But in the arm that everybody was given ivermectin, there is... Um, a reduction in um, malaria incidence. <clears throat> so, um, one thing that I'm very passionate about is indeed capacity building, and I, I didn't put everybody's picture, so um, really sorry if I didn't put your picture. I just uh, didn't have enough time to find everybody's picture, to ask everybody's picture. But yeah, I've done quite, I've had quite a lot of students, and, and I think um, it's not only about a, a student and getting a degree at the end of your time. Um, with me or with anyone. It's also that mentoring, that that working together with someone that you uh, as more senior and you perhaps look up to. I think there's been a lot of that that I've done. So it's mentorship. And I think this is something I'm very passionate about and, and I really hope to continue to do. And I hope to continue to do also mm, <clears throat> more with women. I have a lot of male students. I think uh, I, most of the people who apply are men. And I, I, I of course, I, I respect that and I continue to take male students. I have plenty of them. But um, 
just just to the any women out there, please just uh, be more proactive and apply and try to uh, encourage fellow fellow ladies to take a career in science. Um, so that's something that Anita you pointed out to me that well in my you gave me like, not a, like a pin, pinpoints of what's going to be discussed today. So one of the things that I've also did. I don't have a slide on it, was um, for years when I lived in Tanzania, I used to um, receive students from um, secondary schools and primary schools. And I used to ask, and it was particularly with the primary schools, I used to ask them to, to tell their students before the visit to draw what a scientist looks like. And I tell you, every single person would draw an old man in a lab coat. And once they came into the room, I said, I would say, here are a group of scientists. And of course I picked them, but they were all young ladies, young Tanzanian ladies. And that was so impactful. You would see the girls in the group going, ah, that's a scientist. No, that's not possible. Yes, that's a scientist, a scientist. And she does very complicated things. And actually nobody in our lab looks like that, like this old man with a, uh, in a coat with a long beard or a long fizzy hair. Anyway, um, just to say there are dark, there are these um, concepts and, and, and uh, stereotypes that really need to be broken. And I think that um, as women, we can help, can help um, change that. 